Okay, let's um, take a moment to pray, and we'll get started. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for another new day in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to come before your word and to receive your word. Father, we ask for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes, to open our hearts that we can understand and let these truths be written into our lives by the Holy Spirit so that we may live by these truths, that they will be, become a part of us and we can walk in these truths. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, this is our course on identity, who we are in Christ. Okay? Uh, it's a very simple course, but also it's something very, very important for our lives. It's right? something that should become a part of us. And we have to live by this truth. It should just uh, be something very normal and natural for us uh, to be living out of our identity in Christ. Now we covered the first section, um, revelation of being in Christ. So uh, if you have your lecture notes, you could just uh, quickly look at that. I'll just share the PDF for those who are online. Uh, online students, I'm sure you've all downloaded Okay, let me just. Let me just share this again. All right. So, online students, you can see the PDF and uh, Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. So we covered uh, section one, where we introduced this revelation of who we are in Christ. Uh, where the Lord Jesus taught his, he told his disciples, you're going to receive, you're going to hear this, uh, receive this revelation of who we are in Christ. So let's go to uh, section 2, which will page 22, and uh, we will start from there. Section 2, page 22. Section 2, page 22. Everyone's there? Yeah? So, now we are, we're going to start talking a little bit about this whole aspect of being a new creation. What does it mean to be a new creation? Right? So, we know in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, it's right there in your notes. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. And again, these are scriptures I encourage all of us to memorize, right? Memorize these scriptures, okay? So uh, if you say, well, what's 2 Corinthians 5.17? You should know it, right? So the Apostle Paul tells us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, or it, they are from God. Right? All things that, that have become new, they are from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we want to understand this, begin to get into it. What does it mean to be a new creation? Right? The first thing we want to emphasize here in verse 17 is, it says, if 
anyone is in Christ. That means this is for everybody, anyone, right? So anyone can come into Christ and experience becoming a new creation. So, you know, if, if you and I meet a drunkard or some person who's lived a terrible life and everybody says there is no hope for him, he will never change, he'll die like this. But you and I must think differently. You and I must think according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone comes into Christ, he will become a new That means... As far as Jesus is concerned, he is not beyond hope. This man, who may be a drunkard, may be a terrible life, but if he comes into Christ, he will become a new Christ. The Lord Jesus will make him a new Christ. So he's just one step away from having his whole life changed, just having his whole life transformed. Just one step. He has to come into Christ. If anyone comes into Christ, doesn't matter what their background is, doesn't matter what kind of life they have, if they come into Christ, they will become a new Christ. That's the confidence we have. That's, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's how we operate from, knowing that anyone can come into Christ and become a new creation. So all of us can have this privilege. Now, what does it mean to, have, to become a new creation? Right. We're going to look into it a little bit more and more, step by step. So, lesson number 10. What actually happens is, when we become a new creation, we are born again. We are born again. Or, we are born anew. Or, we could say this way, we are born from above. Or, we are born spiritually. They're all referring to the same thing. Right? So Jesus explained this in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Right? Uh, we will read that passage. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So let's try to understand this. So Nicodemus, he acknowledges that Jesus is somebody sent by God because he's doing all these mighty miracles. Nobody can do this unless God is with him. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, I want you to know something, Nicodemus. Unless a man is born again, he cannot even see God's kingdom. I mean, he cannot even get into God's kingdom. You have to be born again. So Nicodemus is thinking in the natural. I was born, I don't know, let's say he was 50 years old. 50 years ago I was born. How can I be born one more time? What are you talking? What are you saying? And then Jesus says, Nicodemus, Unless a man is born, verse 5, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So how do we understand verse 5? Born of water and the Spirit. So the context, you always have to interpret in line with the context. What, is, what are they first talking about? Natural birth. Nicodemus is thinking about natural birth birth. And so Jesus is now extending it. And you also see in the very next verse, in verse 6, he says, what is born of the flesh is flesh, what is born of the spirit is spirit. So water and spirit. Previous, verse 4, natural birth. 
next verse flesh and spirit so you can interpret that word water as referencing or referring to natural birth it's the context are you understand yes or no then right? so in the context of what is going on you interpret what is being said he said you have to be born of water and the spirit what's the next verse you have to be born of flesh what is born of the flesh is flesh that is natural what is born of the spirit is spirit that is spiritual so previous verse how do you interpret that what is born of the water meaning natural birth what is born of the spirit spiritual birth right that means all of us have to experience two births one is the natural of course which we have all experienced but we also need to be born of the spirit or born from above one is the natural we are born from the earth the other is spiritual we are born from god born from above are you understand no that will be a wrong interpretation if somebody takes verse 5 and says water means water baptism every scripture has to be interpreted in its context is water baptism being referred to anywhere here no so then why do we say it's a wrong interpretation because you're bringing in an idea which is not in the context so it's a wrong interpretation right so the correct way to interpret is always scripture has to be interpreted in its own context what is being spoken what has been said after that correct so if somebody says john 3:5 you have to be born of water and spirit water means water baptism that's a wrong interpretation why look at the next verse you have to be born of the what is born of the flesh is flesh and what is born of the spirit is next verse is telling you very clearly what he said in the previous verse right so next verse is saying natural and spirit so that's how we interpret now another way to interpret scripture all scripture has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture what else is scripture say we know very clearly and we will cross reference this in another place what water is a symbol of the word of god now water is a symbol of the holy spirit also right john 7:37 and 39 the bible jesus said that that when we receive the holy spirit we'll have rivers of living water so water is a symbol of the holy spirit but water is also a symbol of the word of god how do you know that john 15:3 jesus said you are clean through the word i have spoken to you right that means the word the word i've spoken it washes you like water again cross reference First Peter one twenty three, being born again. Let's turn there. Let's turn there. I'll just, since we asked the question, let's uh, just look at it a little bit. First Peter one and verse twenty three, cross reference, right? So you have to interpret scripture in the light of the rest of scripture. Verse twenty three, First Peter one twenty three, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the what is that? the word of god so here he's saying we are born again through the word of god so if somebody says to be born again you have to be born by the word of god and the spirit is that a correct statement yes because first peter 123 says you have to be born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of right so that is also correct statement if somebody says when you're born again you're born by the word and the spirit that is a correct statement because of this verse but if somebody says uh john 35 when it says you're born of water that water means you to be baptized no because it's not in the context and you don't find a cross reference you know um for that you understand that's how you know 
what whether somebody what some somebody's explaining is correct or not you have all scripture has to be interpreted in the light of scripture and also in the rest in the context and in the light of the rest of scripture let's go back to john 3 page 22 so jesus told nicodemus you have to be born again nicodemus is asking how can you be born twice and jesus is explaining you have to be born of water and spirit what does water mean in the context it means natural birth being born of the flesh you're born of the natural is this natural life you have but you need some more something else you need spiritual life you need life from the holy spirit so to be born again is to have life in your spirit spiritual life to be born of the spirit right and then jesus explains verse 7 don't be amazed that you must be born again that means you have to be born again to enter into god's kingdom there's no other way this is the only way don't be amazed do not marvel that i'm telling you you must be born again you have to have this in order to enter the kingdom of god and then he explains this in verse 8 he says to be born of the spirit you can't fully understand it but you can experience it so he gives his example he says, the wind, the wind blows. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. But you can feel it. And he says, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That means you may not explain it, every, you cannot explain it all. But you experience it. You know what's happened to you. You know you're born again. You can't tell, you know, oh, uh, from where it's coming, where it's going. You, you can't explain everything. But you know what's happened. You can feel it. Just like the wind. You know the wind is blowing. You can feel it. You, although you don't understand everything about it. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So, to, be, to become a new creation... What actually happens? We are born again. We are born of the Spirit. We are receiving life from the Holy Spirit. And where do we receive it? We receive it in our spirit. Because this is spiritual life. It's not natural life. It's not life that we are receiving. Right. So on page 23... Uh, we look at those scripture references, 1 Peter 1, 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. And then you also have another cross-reference, Titus 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration, that is being born again, that's another way of saying re, being born again, of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So here you see both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit used in the context of being born again or regeneration, receiving new life. Right. So it's correct to say to be born again. You need the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's how we are born again. So when you hear the Word of God, you hear the Gospel preached to you, and the Holy Spirit comes and He works in somebody's heart, through the Word of God and through the work of the Holy Spirit, they are born again. They receive life from God. Are you all with me so far? Yes? Any questions? Okay, don't be afraid to ask questions. All right, let's go to lesson 11. Let me just see online if there are any questions. Let me pause here. Online students, any questions? Everyone's fine? All right. I, uh, I'm allowed to download the uh, PDF. I, I was trying to download it. 
All right, let's go to lesson number 11. How did we get into Christ? He says, if anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new Christian. How do we get into Christ? How does that happen? Let's look at some scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Now, as, as I said last time, uh, there are about 130 verses, or more than, more than 130 verses in the New Testament that teach us about our life in Christ. I want to encourage you to memorize as many of these scriptures. At least one verse under every topic. Like, so we are going, as we go through this, we will talk about, we'll look at different uh, aspects of our life in Christ. For example, we will talk about the fact that uh, we are a new creation. So to remember, try and memorize at least one verse that tells us we are a new creation. Example, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Or Ephesians 4, 24. We are a new man in Christ, like that. Then we will talk about we are righteous in Jesus. So then try to memorize at least one or two verses that say we are righteous in Christ. Right? So example, 2 Corinthians 5.21, right? that in him we are the righteousness of God. It's so like that. For every topic, try to memorize this because it will help you. And it will also help you fight against the enemy. When the devil comes and puts thoughts of condemnation, immediately in your mind you will say, Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Jesus or Romans 8 33 who will who 31 who will lay anything to the charge of God's elect that means who can bring an accusation against me it is God who has justified me right or Romans 3 22 the righteousness of God which is given to me is upon me and he's been given to me in Jesus Christ right so what happens when the devil brings thoughts of condemnation making you feel guilty worthless condemned Immediately the scriptures come. The scriptures are a weapon against the enemy. You understand it? Right? That's how we fight. We fight with the word of God. So you, you and I must put God's word in our hearts. Right? The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right? Let it dwell in your heart in abundance. Like this Bible must be in your heart. Right, then you can be an overcomer, overcome the enemy. Right? So make the effort you know, to memorize, put it into your heart. Okay? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay? Now, let's go back to the subject here. Lesson number 11. How did we get into Christ? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. Notice it very carefully. But of him you are in Christ Jesus. Or, if you want to read it from the Good News Bible, but God has brought you into union with Christ Jesus. So how did we get into Christ? Who put us into Christ? The pastor? Did the pastor do it? No. Did the church do it? No. Did you get into Christ because you signed your name on a card? How did you get into Christ? God brought you into Christ. So this is a work of God. No man, no man did it. No church did it. No, not because you signed your name somewhere. No. God, 1 Corinthians 1.30, God has brought you into Christ. This is a work that God did in your spirit. The moment you received Jesus, the moment you were born again, God took you and he put you in Christ. This is a work of God itself that took place in your spirit. Right? And the rest of the verse, we will come back to it, but let's just make mention of it. So when, when God put you into Christ, what does that mean? It means 
all that Jesus is, is now yours. So how is that possible? Look at the rest of this verse. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us. That means Jesus became to us our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our... So what's he saying? God took you. He put you in Jesus. And Jesus became who Jesus is. He is the wisdom of God. He is the righteousness of God. He became your wisdom. He became your righteousness. He became your sanctification. He became your redemption. Right? We are going to look at each of these later on. right? But think about this. Christ is your wisdom. Who is Christ? He's the wisdom of God. He became your wisdom. So that means you and I, we have access to the wisdom of God. So in life, like I mentioned last week, in life situations, when we need wisdom, you pray, Lord Jesus, you are my wisdom. I want your wisdom to solve this problem, to know what to say, how to handle the situation, whatever the situation. How should, what should I do? I need your wisdom. Because now Jesus is your wisdom. Jesus is your righteousness. Now, we are going to talk about this in the next lesson. But this is amazing. It means that as a believer, you are as righteous as God. How can you say that? That's what the Bible says. Christ is your Righteous. That means his righteousness has been put upon you. That's the only way we can enter into God's presence. There's no other way. Because anything less than his righteousness is not qualified to enter in his presence. So God said, I'll solve the problem. I'll give you my righteousness. Now you can come in freely. Are you understanding? But Christ is your righteousness. So that, has, that truth should be in your heart. Jesus is my righteousness. My righteousness is not based on the works I did. Oh, today I read two chapters, so God is happy with me. No, it's good you read two chapters. But God is not happy with you just because you read two chapters. God sees you because you, Christ, is your righteousness. It's good to, you know, do all the right things. I'm not saying. But Christ is your righteousness. Christ is your sanctification. Sanctification means to be set apart for God, to be made holy. Christ himself is that holiness. Again, we'll talk about each of these things in detail. Christ is our redemption. Right? So, the moment we came into Christ, all who Jesus is becomes available to us. This is amazing, right? The, the truth to be in Christ. Okay? But how did we get into Christ? God has brought you into union with God did this. He brought you into union with Jesus. Lesson number 12. Ephesians 2, verse 10. Look at that verse. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus so again in Christ Jesus so to underline that that's what we are studying in Christ Jesus what's this verse telling us we are God's workmanship that means we are something God is doing it's like God is the potter we are the clay we are his workmanship. God is the artist. We are the painting. God is the poet. We are the poetry. We are his workmanship. We are something God is doing. But notice the next few verses. Created in Christ Jesus. So think about that word, created. That means when you and I were born again, 
a creative work of God took place. Creative work. That means something that didn't exist came into existence. Something that didn't exist came into, that's creation. Creation, coming into existence. So when we were born again, a creative work of God, God's power, creative power took us and he put us into Christ. We became a new creation. So in being born again, God's creative power acted upon our spirit, in our spirit, and he put us into Christ. Right? So we don't understand everything about this. Like Jesus said, you know, wind comes from somewhere, it goes somewhere. We don't understand it. But we can only say what the scripture is saying. The scripture is saying, God created us in Christ. So that means there was a creative work of God that took place when he put us in Christ. And what else? The rest of the verse says, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in Christ, there are good works. There are things that God wants you to do. And God has already planned this for you to walk in. So that's another aspect of it. But we are looking at that create, created in Christ. And God created us in Christ. Lesson number 13. Another aspect of being in Christ, of being a new creation. How did we get into Christ? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit... That means the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, that is into Christ, the body of Christ. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and are all been made to drink into one Spirit. So that means the Holy Spirit, the word baptize simply means to immerse. So here it's talking about a different kind of baptism. The Holy Spirit, by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit baptized us into Christ. He immersed us into Christ. So who put us in Christ? The Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said you have to be born of the Spirit. What will the Holy Spirit do? He'll come and He'll take us and He will immerse us into, put us into Christ. So, in the New Testament, there are three baptisms. There is water baptism. There is Holy Spirit baptism. And there is baptism into Christ. You understand? One, water baptism. In water baptism, what happens? One believer... Baptizes another believer in water. Right? So who's doing the baptism? A believer. And what are we baptized into in water? You know, but it's 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 in the natural. Second, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit baptism. There, Matthew chapter three, verse eleven. What happens? There, the Lord Jesus is the baptizer. He baptizes the believer in the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist said, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew 3, 11. So Holy Spirit baptism, who's doing it? Jesus. And what are we baptized into? The Holy Spirit. Water baptism, who's doing it? A believer, and we are baptized in water. Third, First Corinthians twelve thirteen, the baptism into Christ. Who's doing it? Holy Spirit, and He's baptizing the believer into Christ. You understand these three? Yes or no? Clear. So, um. In the New Testament, we read about these three baptisms. One minute, just.
Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will explain that. Fire. What What does fire mean? All right. Uh, we'll come to that question. So the question is in Matthew three eleven, he'll baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. What does fire mean? And before we come to that, if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter six and verses one and two. Just to show you that baptisms is in plural. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms. Plural. Okay? So that means there are there, there are there are are more than one baptism there are three baptisms like we explain right you understood what the three baptisms are i'll repeat one more time first is water baptism reference for that matthew 28 19 and 20 right who's doing it one believer is doing it and he's baptizing in water okay so one believer it could be a pastor, it could be anybody. You, 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 you're immersing the other person in water in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Water baptism. Second, Holy Spirit baptism. Reference, Matthew 3.11, Acts 1.5. There, the Lord Jesus is baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. So the, we are immersed in the Holy Spirit. The purpose there is for power. Right? Water baptism, purpose is your testimony for Jesus. You're, being, you're testifying that you are now a follower of Jesus. It's a testimony of what has happened. Holy Spirit baptism, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit for power to be a witness. The third baptism is baptism into Christ. Reference, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The Holy Spirit. Baptizes the believer into Christ. What is the purpose there? For us to be in Christ. To be in union with Christ. To come into Christ. Okay, one minute. I will answer this question, then I'll answer your question, then I'll come to your question. Right, one by one. So, the question here was, uh, based on Matthew 3.11, what does fire mean? So, you read the next verse. So Matthew 3, 11, he would baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So look at the context. The context there is this. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. And so that is in verse, uh, next verse. Yeah, verse, uh, verse yeah. He will baptize the Holy Spirit fire. Uh, verse 12. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He'll gather his wheat into the barns, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So what's he going, what is this fire going to do? This fire is going to burn up the chaff. What does chaff represent in the Bible? It's talking, represents everything that's of the flesh. Right? So the next verse. Just so he's giving a picture. What's a picture? It's a picture of a farmer. You know, they, how do they separate the wheat? So they have this winnowing uh, thing. So what do they call it? In? So they do like this. The wind will remove the husk and the grain will remain in the, in the uh, what is it called? Whatever that, sieve kind of thing, right? So you have that thing, right? You, you do like this. The wind will blow. The grain will remain in the, in the, that, that whatever that is, but all the husk and the chaff will fall on the ground. What will they do after that? So they have got the grain, they've got the good thing, the, the real thing, the grain. Chaff, they'll sweep it, burn it. So that's what the fire does. It burns up the unnecessary things in our life. That's the picture in verse 12. You understand it? So he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. What is that fire? Next verse. Read the next verse. He's telling you. 
all the unnecessary things he will burn with fire that means this is purifying the fire is for purifying holy spirit is for so the baptism of the holy spirit brings power and purity holy spirit and fire you understanding yes or no you have to read the next verse right if you only read my verse 11 and say something you know read the next verse meaning is there okay your question Vinay. yes 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 so so when so so the question here is the question Vinay is asking I'll I'll say it for all of us is in water baptism one believer is immersing the other believer in the name of Jesus Holy Spirit baptism, one believer is praying with another believer. Of course, the Lord Jesus is baptizing them in the Holy Spirit. But usually we lay hands, we pray for them, we minister that way. That's happening. So the question is, in the third case, when we are being baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit, we are being baptized, Where? what's the agency of the believer? What does the believer do? Well, the believer brings the words under the anointing. So what happens? So you can imagine if I am speaking to another individual or we are preaching in a crowd, whatever it is. We are proclaiming Jesus. We are proclaiming the word with the help of the Holy Spirit. That person believes the message and they accept Christ. So till that point, God is working through the life of the believer. But when that person makes that decision, the Holy Spirit takes them and baptize them, baptizes them into Christ. You understand? So till that extent, God uses the believer. In most cases, sometimes, you know, somebody may read the Bible themselves and get saved, or they may read a tract and get saved. Those kinds of things are there. But generally, God uses the believer to bring that message and lead that person to encounter Jesus. Your question? Yes. Uh, can you please pause the mic? I can't hear what your question is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I can hear you. Uh, so then, baptism into Christ, reference Bible. Ah, uh, bap baptism into Christ. Right? First Corinthians twelve, verse thirteen. First Corinthians twelve thirteen. By one Spirit. We are all baptized into one body. And what body? It's the body of Christ. So one by one spirit, we are all brought into Christ. We are made part of his body, a part of him. All right. Anyway, that was a side journey. I didn't want to spend so much time on it. But lesson number 13, main thing. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, just use the mic so I can... So, the first thing is we are born again. A person has to be born again. That means at that moment they are baptized into Christ. First Corinthians 12 13 happens. Or they are born of the Spirit happens, right? The other two can happen in any order. It doesn't, there's no particular order. Because when you see the book of Acts, sometimes we see people are baptized in the Holy Spirit first, and then they are baptized in water. Example, Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Peter is preaching in the house of Cornelius. They are listening to the gospel. They believe. They're saved. Immediately they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. They start praying in tongues. After that, they are baptized in water. Okay. In some cases, it happens the other way. They, after being saved, they are baptized in water. Then they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Example, Acts chapter 19, 
verses 1 to 6. Paul goes to Ephesus. He finds some disciples. They don't know about G being baptized in the name of Jesus. So he teaches them about that. They are baptized in water. Then he lays hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. Same thing in Samaria, Acts chapter 8. They hear the gospel. Philip comes and preaches to them. They are saved. They are baptized in water. Then Peter and John come to lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. So it can happen either way. No set order. Okay? So, going back to lesson 13, is the Holy Spirit who brings us into Christ. So the moment you're born again, He connects you with Jesus. He places you into Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? Lesson number 14. We'll just mention this and then we'll go for a break. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. So what does it mean to be in Christ? It's to become one spirit, spiritually one with Jesus. We are joined together with Jesus. Your spirit is now joined with Jesus. You're connected to Jesus. You've become spiritually one with the Lord. So that means spiritually, you're connected. Okay? So the best way to imagine it is like how Jesus said, He said, I am the wine, you are the branches. The branches are connected to the wine. Now, we have to think about that in the spiritual sense. Spiritually, your spirit, you are the branch, you are connected to Jesus. How? Your spirit to spirit connection. So to be in Christ means you are joined with Him. You are spiritually one with Jesus. Okay? So we will come back to this and we will, we will build on it. Let's go for a break and we will continue with this. I will come back in 10 minutes, uh, 10 o'clock and...